Hey everybody, welcome to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, excited about today's episode because I'm talking to Sean Crystal, the fine penciler and inker of uh, many a Marvel book and other great projects as well. He uh, just did that juggernaut one-shot uh, for X-Men on Marvel, and uh, we, it's Inktober, the end of Inktober, and uh, this is a good chance to talk to uh, one of the premier penciler and inkers. He is also a great podcaster, and we talk a lot about Ink Pulp Audio, which is his uh, interview show where he speaks to artists, and uh, it's great. And of course, being an artist, they can talk shop and uh, you know get through the nitty gritty that I, a layman, can't do. And uh, it's one of my uh, favorite uh, other interview comic book podcasts out there. And so it's uh, great to compare notes and see how we do things and how it uh, differs from uh, person to person. But I really enjoyed today's conversation. Sean Crystal talking about his art and his podcasting on today's Word Balloon. This episode of Word Balloon is sponsored by Aftershock Comics. They're shaking things up at your local comic shop right now. Great series like A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Goran Suzuka, Baby Teeth with Donnie Cates and Gary Brown, Animosity with Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour. Other great titles as well. My buddy Paul Jenkins has Beyonders, him and Wesley St. Clair, Lollipop Kids from Adam and Aiden Glass and Diego Yapur. You can find out some great comic books at their website. You can check out preview pages and also get the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local comic shop at AfterShotComics.com. Word Balloon is also brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you very much, League, for your support via Patreon. Um, I thank you because I have been grinding out episodes and uh, trying to give you more content with the more free time that I currently have. And uh, I hope you're enjoying these great shows. Uh, it's uh, through your uh, you know, benefit and subscriptions through Word Balloon that uh, make this possible. So thank you very much. If you'd like to subscribe to Word Balloon, it's not necessary. Word Balloon is free. It'll always be free. But if you like what I do and would like to help the cause, you can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or click on the Patreon ad at wordballoon.com right on the front page. Thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. All right, without further ado, let's get into our conversation with Sean Crystal, talking about his art, his process, his podcast process with Ink Pulp Audio, and uh, it's a great conversation. I'm happy to share it with you on today's Word Balloon. All right, man. So I don't know who's introducing who first. Um, why don't you? It's your show. You introduce. Okay. Okay. I didn't, oh, yeah. No, and that's fine. You know, sh- shame on me, man, because I wasn't sure if you wanted to use this as an Ink Pulp Audio. Sean um, I, yes, I mean, I definitely would like to, but I feel like I'm on your show since we're okay. doing it through Skype, but I would definitely <laughs> air it as uh, Ink Pulp Audio, John Suntrace with Sean Crystal. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> well, welcome to Word Balloon, Sean Crystal. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. No, it's a long time coming. We did a panel, as you well know, back in uh, 2015, when the Tony Moore's yeah. Cincinnati Comic Cons, and uh, we were on with uh, Wendy Friedman, and uh, Freeman, excuse me. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's good to do a one on one and talk shop. Yeah, it's long things, overdue. Yeah, how things are going, man? How many years have you been doing Ink Pulp? Um, that's a good question. I'm on episode eighty one or eighty two. I'm doing twelve a year, but one year I did twenty four. So I guess this is year six. Is that okay. right? So two thousand twelve ish. 2011 yeah. maybe yeah i think that to, actually i can i can tell you while we're talking okay but yeah uh, I, I mean i know i know you started a couple of years later than me and yeah i noticed that i was looking at your um your episode list and i did notice that you break things down in seasons and you do it you know oh actually i am way off 2012 okay that's fine wow all right yeah, we figured eleven or twelve, but very good, excellent, man. And yeah, you like you said, you've done like seven seasons. Yeah, wow, awesome, man. Congrats. I mean, seriously, you. you know, you get great people, and I know uh, you're talking to other artists and discussing process. And I, you know, when when you do the show, I mean, I, I you know, the, we we never uh, we never close the lights here, as they say in Chicago. Not turn off the <laughs> lights, close the lights. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, you know, twenty four seven here at Word Balloon. Not that much, but I, I'll, I'll be, honest, I'll be honest. The last couple of months, because I've had more time, uh, I've certainly done more than four a month. I've been doing sometimes eight a month, sometimes ten. Wow, wow, uh, yeah. This is like the seventh one I think I've done for October. 
Wow. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, with podcasting, I, I think you, like when I started it, it, it was you had to do at least four a month. And I, I just I can never I can't do it. I, I tried. Understand. I tried twice a month for a year and I was like, I cannot keep up with that. It's time consuming. So, I get it. No, it is. And, yeah. And yeah. well, you know, and, and some great shows. I mean, I, I'm interested to hear what other podcasts, they don't have to be comic book ones that you listen to, but I know some of my favorite shows go away for a few months. My favorite Hollywood, old Hollywood podcast, you must remember this. She breaks yeah, the, yeah. Katrina Longworth, she breaks things down into seasons. Uh, and then you got Joe Rogan, who does it sometimes four times a week. Yeah, well, yeah and he goes long, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the marathon <laughs> conversations, absolutely. They're intense, though. They're great. I mean, I, I'll confess I don't listen to every episode, but when he's got somebody that I want to hear, it's great because it's a nice, intense, long conversation. It is intense. Yeah, yeah. I tried with Rogan for a little while. I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't <laughs> do it for too long. Well, I just listen to the comedian ones. Yeah, or when he has when he has movie people on or pop culture people that I I give it to him about. He has great people. He definitely has great. I should give it another try. There was a few people that were kind of regulars on the show that just drove me insane and I couldn't do it. Okay. Well, and I and I'll admit that I I don't and it shouldn't matter, but you know, some sometimes his politics, I don't agree with them or just hey man, I'm a boxing guy, he's an MMA guy. Right. And and there's every now and then I'm a little interested in what's going on in MMA, but not enough to really do it regularly. And, and obviously, you know, his background being MMA, you know, that's kind of, right. I think the backbone of what, what he likes to talk about, but he impresses me. He's innately curious. He yes. covers a lot of different subjects. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I love that. And I mean, that's the thing. He's very comfortable talking about, you know, at least 20 different things and, and does it quite well. Yeah, he really does. I mean, and look, he's found, his podcast is so huge. I mean, oh, he's yeah. doing something right. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, um, yeah, I don't. Um, well, you know, beyond that, what's going on uh, art wise? What are you What are you currently working on, man? Uh, I just was inking a panel. I'm doing. Um, uh, I don't know if this is even announced yet, but I don't think it's a big deal. The, the, I'm doing a uh, like the, Marvel's doing an, uh, a holiday special, uh, X Men holiday special. Funny. So, uh, and I believe they're all like one page stories. Interesting. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's just like a peek in, like what do the X-Men do on the holidays? And so I, I'm working on that right now and, uh, gearing up for this juggernaut release on Wednesday. Oh, cool. Wow. Uh, so you're, are you on this juggernaut uh, series? Is that what's going on or? It was, uh, it was a one shot part of that X-Men black, um, series they were doing, I think there, there was five of them and they, it's each, each villain got one issue and I assume they'll collect it all into one X-Men black book. But through the month of October, every week there's an issue coming out with one week having two issues mm -hmm. and they're all number ones. And they're all like, there's Magneto. I got Juggernaut. There's Mojo. There's Emma Frost. And I believe Mystique is the last of them. Okay, and who wrote who wrote your issue? Uh, Robbie Thompson wrote my issue. Cool. So every every book's a different creative team. Um, it was the first time I worked with Robbie. He's a lot of fun to work with. Excellent. And are you do, just doing inks, or are you doing pencils too? No, no, I pencil and ink everything I do. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we got Rico Renzi to color it. It, it came okay. out really. Nice. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. That's awesome, man. Cool. And is this the first time you worked with Robbie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was good. I liked working with him. Do you like drawing the juggernaut? Yeah, I mean, I, this was a this was a childhood dream. I mean, what artist doesn't, but this was a childhood dream. Like to get to like I remember the first time I I saw the juggernaut in a comic. It was Excalibur. Um Alan Davis was drawing. I assume it was Claremont writing and the uh, juggernaut came in and just took out captain britain real quick and i was sold <laughs> <laughs> i was sold and uh then he was on that x-men cartoon that that pilot they did they never did a full season of it but they had that one episode in the late 80s i think it was and he was on there and i, and I was just in i mean the x-men were my favorite 
and he was definitely my favorite villain and I just I love drawing him always and I also got to draw in this issue they asked me when we were getting started they knew the first half of the issue would be the juggernaut fighting the X-Men so they asked me what era of X-Men I would like to draw and another dream of mine has always been to draw the original X-Men in their original costumes and so I got to do that for this book. So getting to draw those X-Men fighting the juggernaut, uh, it, it was unreal. That's was, awesome. Yeah. My, the kid in me was real happy. <laughs> you know, they're, uh, the original, is it, it's five, right? Yeah. Five. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say the original five are my favorite X-Men. And me- I, I have to confess that when they, you know, started to expand, you know, I'm like, oh, that's nice. I don't know if I, I give a damn, but all right, whatever. And then when it got ridiculous in the 90s, <laughs> I'm like, too many X-Men. And it was so yeah. funny when, you know, Wanda declares no more mutants. And it's like, yeah, no more mutants, just 198 of them. I'm like, too <laughs> many X-Men. And I know I'm in the minority, and it's okay. I don't mind. I mean, obviously, you know. No, I've- I mean, my introduction to the X-Men was the late 80s, so they were already a sizable team. Yes. Um. So it was later that I discovered, I mean, through that, discovering the originals. It was really the costumes that I fell in love with. Um, the black and like gold. Team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah I they, liked it, too. I liked them, yeah. too. And when, I, you know, reading the X-Men, they they were just like, they didn't have like a cohesive look when I first started reading them. Yeah. So seeing them in that, you know what it was? I'm remembering now. It was Simonson was doing X-Factor which was a nod to the original team. Yes, absolutely. At the time, and I, I liked that much, a yeah. lot more. Yeah. yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah, that was great. And and it was Walt and Weezy, I think, uh, doing yeah, it. Yeah, it was. It was, yeah. So, yeah, the full si- – Team Simonson, if you will. Yeah, so that – yeah, I remember, like, I loved that. So every time I'd get to see a glimpse of the original X-Men in the normal X-Men comic, I would get excited. Agreed. And I'll be honest, that's why I liked uh, Bendis' story. So right. much that the original five, you know, travel to the future and everything. Right. I mean, yeah. What's, what's wrong with this picture? What the hell happened? You know, right. and, I, and I and I really and there were just great moments in all of that that I, I enjoyed a lot with the original five. So, no, I get it. And I felt the same way when X Factor came out. I'm like, oh, that's good. They put the original five back together. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. So I that, get that. I mean, yeah. So getting to draw that, I mean, A, being asked, what do I want to draw, which never happens. Usually the script is done and they're waiting on the art before they hire the artist. Um, so that was really nice. That was a really rare gem. Do you occasionally do monthlies? Because I usually see you come in on a special or an annual or, or, or a, you know, this kind of project. No, it's – I can't – I'm not that fast and I don't want to give up inking myself. Okay. Why um, is I that? Just, Let's talk for, about that for a second. Yeah, my my – inks are kind of my signature um it, it's me like i feel like it's me on the page when the inks are done because mm-hmm. i don't feel like my inks look like anything but me and as i'm penciling i'm penciling in mind with how i would ink it uh, i had a, a couple inkers once or twice in my career just due to scheduling necessities and they were great inkers uh, it just wasn't me and to my own financial detriment, I stick to my guns on that one. I mean, if I were to pencil a, a monthly book, I'd be doing much better. But I, I don't know. I, I just I, – A, I enjoy inking and I don't know. I, I, I Yeah, I just wanted – I want it to look like I want it to look. I hear you, man. Well, and um, have you inked others, others' pencils? No. I, you know, it's something I'm I'm interested in playing with. I was very careful early on because that would come up because a lot of artists really liked my inks when I was first coming in sure. and we would talk and, and I don't remember if I spoke to someone. Um, I don't rem- I don't think so. I think I just thought to myself, if I start inking people, that's what I'll start being hired for more and more. And, and this was before, well, this was at the dawn of, the digital process. So inkers were, were needed more. And I didn't want to just ink. Like I would like to ink a few artists I like and a few friends just for fun to play with. Like Carrie Nord and I are talking about, cause we're both in essential sequential, him penciling a print and me inking it. 
like just for fun. And that, that I would like to do. Uh, I think I would learn a lot as an artist from that. And, and I think I'd enjoy it, but inking page after page of someone, I, I don't know. That doesn't sound great. I hear you, man. Okay. What is the you know, essential uh, sequential? Essential sequential is, uh, it, it, it's an art group represented by Jason Schachter. He's basically our art dealer. Okay. And, and at conventions, you'll see us all set up. It's purple banners, essential sequential. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, talk about, I mean, I know the guys, and, and yeah, so Kennedy's in there. Yeah, Kennedy, Mateo, Galera, yep, Dave yep. Nosian, Dave Johnson, Cully Hamner. Yes, indeed. Ben Sale, Klaus Jansen. Yes. Ben Gall is in there. Uh, it, it's gotten so big, I'm... No, but you're – yeah, I, uh, I I was in your row, obviously, at New York and, and yeah, you know, yeah. making the rounds with all of those guys. I didn't see Cully. Cully might be listening and going, you didn't talk to me. And I'm yeah, like, Cully oh, was I, there. I meant to. No, I meant to. He just hadn't, didn't happen to be there my moment. You know, I at New York, I was only there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I pretty much would get there in the afternoon. I was staying far enough away that I would just have yeah. my time coming in and also kind of dreading – the usual yeah. New York yeah. chaos. So I'm it, like, you know, if I come so after noon. It's so chaotic. Yeah. yeah. So chaotic. But it's I have to say, so in, in fairness, it was a much easier year, traffic yeah. wise and congestion wise. I agree. I totally agree. So that was a pleasant surprise, but I still, you know, didn't want to take any any chances. And um, no, I, I saw Dave. And I, uh, you know, spoke to spoke to Dave. Happened to see uh, Kirkman at the same time as Dave, so that was a nice little. All right, I've seen both of you. Very good. Oh, I was walking around. <laughs> yeah, I saw Robert was walking, walking around. around. Yeah. And um, I finally approached Klaus and got his info, and he will do word balloon. And I'm oh I'm yeah, very excited. Have you had Klaus on yours? Yeah, yeah. That one um, just came out on my Patreon. On October first, so on November first, he'll be out for the, uh, the public. My dad will be out. It's one of my favorite episodes I've recorded for a lot of reasons. One being, I can trace. I, I didn't grow up with comics. I, I fell in love with comics when I was uh, fourteen. I think it was okay. And um, I like drawing, and I really enjoyed drawing uh, superhero stuff because of the cartoons I grew up. But then I always wanted to draw Spider Man because that was the cartoon from my childhood, and I just thought I wanted to go into animation. I just had never known anyone who read comics or hadn't been exposed to them. And some kid in one of my classes would. He saw me drawing a few times and he brought in the Dark Knight Returns and he handed it to me and said, read this. Wow. Good and that was it. That was it. <laughs> I was done. Uh, and, and so, you know, from there, I went to the comic store and I just, you know, Frank Miller, Klaus Jansen, I just looked for that. So then I found a collection of Born Again. And then that just took me out again. So getting to interview Klaus was like, getting back to the reason I like, I, I think I even started it saying, you, you know, you're the, I have you to blame for me being here. <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> and I, you know, my love for inking comes from that as well. And so we had a really nice long discussion about inking and, you know, Klaus is, he's much more than a superstar. He's much more than simply a, a, a legend in, in the medium. I mean, he's, He's a master of the medium in, in all aspects of it, but he doesn't act like it. He just acts like – like I remember early on when I joined Essential Sequential, he would just come up and say hi and chat. And I'm like, but that's Klaus Jansen. Like what are you doing? <laughs> like, I don't deserve that. That's a luxury. <laughs> so um, having you know all that in my mind, but he is a friend now, so – all, all of that just made for a great interview and, and a big part of it was talking about inking and the craft of inking and he was he was coming from the um, the side where he thinks the uh, art of inking is is a dying art and while I understand that uh, I'm pretty sure the conversation my take is uh, I don't think it's dying I think it's 
becoming better, what you're doing is you're weeding out the mid ground. Like when photography came out, people said painting would die, but painting didn't die. It just became something completely unto itself. And the great painters became better painters and the mediocre painters started taking pictures. I'm with you. So I I feel like with inking, like you've got some of the best inkers ever producing comics right now. Um, but you don't have like it used to be inking was just a necessity. So out of necessity, you had a lot of people trained to be inkers who were mediocre artists at best and, you know, mediocre inkers at best. And I think we've we that, that with the digital workflow now, you weed some of that out. But when I see like even someone like Jonathan Glapion, he he's amazing. Yes, what he is. he's doing with his his brushes and his quills and his line and his texture, like it just blows my mind. And it's a smaller community. So we all kind of like, we talk. And one of the things I'm trying to do with my podcast is start to get an oral, I don't want to say history, but just capture Inker's ideas on inking as much as I can. And uh, Klaus was a big get for that. Understood. Yeah, man. So do you um, I, I didn't realize that. Are you really focusing primarily on anchors? Uh, no, but when I, I want to have a handful of episodes that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, when people are coming up wanting to learn inking, they can go listen to those those episodes. Understood. Um, so I am trying to I'm not I'm not specifically seeking that out only. But I, I am – when I interview someone and we can talk about inking, I am very excited about that. No, I get it. And also I am – I've heard those same things and I know I was concerned uh, in the earlier 2000s that maybe inking was on its way out as Klaus maybe thought. And right. um, so I, I get that concern and talking to some inkers, you know, do you find as an – I mean – um is there more work for you if you wanted it, if you were fast enough as far as inking goes? Well, again, you're doing both. You're penciling and inking. Yeah, I'm penciling and inking. Um, so, you know. I, yeah, I mean, it's hard, I, I don't, it's hard for me to say. I don't think there's as many inking jobs, like just inking. I mean, yeah. I think most people, because they're working digitally, most more current artists are simply – I mean, I, I don't even want to call it inking, but yes, they're they're producing their own black line work. Sure, and Glapian is an exception, obviously. Yeah, because yeah. he he does work with other pencilers and stuff. And no, yeah. I agree with you, man. I I met him in one of my first years of podcasting, two thousand five, two thousand six. Oh, really? Yeah, and he's only gotten better. Yeah, you know, he can draw really well too. Beautiful artist, beautiful. Yeah, artist. No. He really is incredible. Well, and like you said, though, I mean, and you know, um. I mean, another guy like that uh, is Bill Reinhold, who I yes. think is known primarily as only an anchor. Yeah. Uh, you know, he could produce his own stuff. For sure. And, and I love Bill. Bill's, Bill's a local Chicago guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, and, no. you know, also I think when I look back at the artists who really inspired me early on, um, they were inking themselves. Like Walter Simonson. Like mm-hmm. you take away his inks and – it's not him anymore. And and I think that's why I stick to me inking myself. I hear you. No, I, that, that makes sense. I could could trace that back to Walt exclusively. That makes sense. What, um, do you, speaking of digital and stuff, are you working on tablets? Are you still working on paper and then scanning? How are you doing it? Um, I prefer, and I mainly work completely traditionally and scan it, but in order to stay current with technology and applications and stuff, I, I do every now and then hop on, I have a Cintiq, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I've done everything. I mean, I, when I, I, when I was doing the Phantom X Max mini series at Marvel, I did, uh, the first issue I started thumbnailing on the uh, Cintiq, and then I started penciling and printing out blue lines. And then, I don't know, I want to say like two or three issues in, I just went full digital to to see what I could get from it. And at the time, my inks were very, very controlled, very clean, very sharp. So there was very little difference 
uh, in, when you see the book between the traditional inks and the digital inks. And that made me think more about what I'm doing with ink, like actual ink. And after that, you see a shift in my work where I got much more textural and I embraced the dry brush and I got rough paper and thick ink and really tried to produce something very hand done looking. Whereas before I was trying to make something perfect. Interesting. So like, uh, for example, the job I'm doing now, it's that one pager, Mm -hmm, the Christmas thing. Yeah. So it's, it's nine panels. It's like 34 word balloons. It's like three settings. It's just an insane amount of stuff on one page. Hmm. And so I decided what I would do is I'd thumbnail it, pencil it digitally, print out the blue lines, and then I went back and I'm just inking it with like microns because there's so much stuff on it. There's no room to kind of cut loose with the inks. So I'm treating it more like a – just a really clean, almost Saturday morning cartoon look to the inks. Yeah. So I'm also liking that idea now where – I'm trying to approach different jobs with what do I feel like I want to do on this? What is this job asking from me as an artist instead of always doing the same thing? That's great. That's wonderful, yeah. man. Well, and you're that kind of artist. I get that. What I have. That? I've always been. I've been scared to do that because I felt like um, the editors would feel like I have an identity crisis, <laughs> which I think is a well, yeah, because I understand. You know, yeah, if they're they're they don't know what they're getting. Like, I sure. would worry about that. No one ever said that to me. It was all in my head. <laughs> and then I was like, what am I doing? Like, I got into this field because I love this and I love drawing. And all my artist friends who have known me for 10, 15 years now know that I'm always playing with doing different things. So now I'm trying to incorporate that into the work. Well, and I think you kind of vocalize your own. Uh, if not struggle, but just you know your your decisions and what you're thinking about with your art on your podcast. Yeah, and, very and, much. So. And and I love that. And I also love that a lot of times it is. It's kind of like a therapy session between you and your guest, where you yeah. really are both of you, you know <laughs> both you and who you're talking to. You kind of you know work out styles and and fears and and things that you are thinking about in terms of how you're presenting yourself with your art, which I think is great. It makes your show that much more unique thank and, you i mean yeah man well that's that's the thing man i honestly i love talking to other podcasters and what are you doing how are you doing it and a lot of it just comes through from the final product but you know beyond and i, I man i always feel like i'm shitting on these other uh comic book podcasts that are just all right we all got together this is what i read this is what i think there's nothing wrong with that that's fantastic right right but i kind of like you know as you know i am a layman talking yes. to people like yourself and yeah. other creators and just asking the the general questions and love the bits of process that I get just from, you know, the confessional that the interview becomes versus really knowing what right questions to ask and everything. But, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm coming, you know, in my head, I'm I'm doing what I've loved about my favorite magazines, not only things like Amazing Heroes and the Comics Journal, right. as, as far as how they've approached it, but even Rolling Stone and Musician. Right, right. Well, your you passion know. comes through. I mean, it's it's there's an excitement in you, and you also, I mean, you have a very thorough knowledge base, but it's, I, I feel like with you, there's so much passion coming through what, your podcast, and just when you speak, that that makes what you do interesting and exciting and different. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Well, it's just what entertains me. And and I want to talk about, what you know, hey, I, what you did is great. I mean, it's really a more elaborate Chris Farley show, I'll, I'll confess. <laughs> it really is like, oh, what you do, that's awesome. And, and it, But, you know, obviously, <laughs> I'm like, hopefully the years of doing radio and stuff, I get to ask it in a little better way. But, yeah, that's essentially what it is. It's just, no, I'm fascinated by creativity. And, um, you know, yeah, what inspires everybody to do what they do? So, yeah, I mean, that's how I approach it. But, yeah, like I said, I like I like that all of us that do interviews, you can't help it. You are who you are. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so it's going to come through in the way that you're asking questions and everything. Yeah, and, true. And yeah, so that's why a lot of times I uh, – sometimes I'm like, oh, all these other shows have Greg Rucka on right now. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't talk to Greg Rucka right now. You know, I'm going to wait a, week, a couple weeks and stuff. Brubaker used to always like kind of drop out of the air and be like, okay, I'm here. 
who wants to talk to me? <laughs> and usually about the same five shows we talk to him all at the same week or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, and then but, he disappear again. But that's what I think that's what makes a great podcast a great podcast. It's not who you're interviewing, it's it's the person doing the interview as much as, as the person you're interviewing. I, I think that comes from – I mean Howard Stern is just great at that. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Well, storytelling, man. And I mean that's yeah. – and it's the conversation that is the star of the show. And that's – you know, you try to get out of the way of, of the person that you're talking to. Let them make their points. But yeah, you don't want to – you don't want to disappear either. So no. it's interesting though because like Marin – I was listening to Mark Marin today. And he, and he released a John Cleese conversation. Oh, wow. And I liked it, but also I know, having heard a million other John Cleese interviews, both live performances and radio interviews and TV interviews, that Marin was kind of like missing stories because he couldn't help but get to the next thing. Right. And it's like, you know, dude. And like, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I worked in radio. And it's like, yeah, really? Then what happened? And it's like, Oh, yeah, oh, I, yeah. With Marin, like, I mean, obviously, Marin. If you've heard my podcast, is probably the biggest influence on me. I know doing that. it, um, but I, I stopped listening to it years ago. Um, like early on, when he was interviewing comedians only, and there were people he knew, I found those conversations to be some of the most fascinating. Like, I don't even want to call them interviews. Just there were conversations, and they were the most fascinating things I had heard, and it made me want to do podcasting. And when he became really big and successful and was interviewing people he didn't know, I lost a lot of interest for it because the um, – um, the I guess it was just the familiarity of, of knowing the person he was talking to bought something there. He's a great interviewer. I'm not saying what he's doing is, is bad. It just – it had changed, and I was no longer interested in it. I feel the same way, man. And I and I'll even go a step further. It's not he doesn't even necessarily for me need to be so familiar with his guest that they could just you know get into the inside baseball of their own friendship and their shared experiences. But that um, you know he there are times when you know yeah he has no idea who he's talking to and didn't decide to do that much research and it's just going to kind of. You know, get by on what he can do, and again, no disrespect. He, right, he's right. An no, effective, it's so great. Yeah, if this is this is kind of getting to something I'm going through. Is that does a podcast have a shelf life? Does the identity um, of the podcast change? I mean, for me, like as you you know, because you've listened, I, I spent a lot of time working through a lot of mental shit. Yeah, and and I feel like. You know, I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, oh, I've been complaining for a long time and things <laughs> haven't gotten much better. So maybe I need to try this other approach of, of being positive and thinking positively. But I've attracted a large audience of people who are like minded and working through it. So then I went through a period where I was like, what am I doing? Like, I, I don't want to always be negative And. I also don't want to lose my audience. And, and so what I'm trying to do now is, is if they're attracted to the podcast because of the struggles, well, we all have that. I don't want to lose that, but I don't want to be stuck in them. So I want to try to offer um, some light in those dark areas and try to work past them and try to change things for the better. I need to do it for myself personally. So I'm using the vehicle of the podcast to continue to do that. But it does make me feel like, you know, is I, I don't think it's going to change too much. But I did worry about it for a period of time. But it, getting to like Marin's WTF, is it is it still WTF? Like I haven't listened to it in a while, but I felt like it wasn't, and that's why I stopped. I think it is, but he, you know, he's gone through his own personal changes, as you know. Right. I mean, he he really was kind of. I mean, he he confessed that I think losing that Air America job. He was kind of like, "Where's my career going?" He's, you know, I, but I think we all go through that. And yeah, I think, I'm there right now. I mean, I'm. Uh, it's been the hardest year professionally of my life ever, and I didn't want to spend the year whining on my podcast about it. I wanted to change it because I mean, I, I looked at it like I've been complaining about the same stuff since day one, and I and I'm always trying to make it better, but it's not getting better. So I had to look at doing something different. 
Well, you know, honestly, just being a little bit older and everything, actually a lot older, uh, <laughs> I think, honestly, man, I, I think this is what we all go through. And, you know, you, I, I, I say it's not wisdom, it's perspective. Because believe me, man, I, I had my own, you know, crisis of career uh, really in last year, 2017, because I was cut loose at the end of 2016 from my regular full-time radio job. And it's like, all right, what do I want to do? And, man, I'll tell you, I talk to as many old comic vets that I really respect and are friends with and everything, guys that are older than me, that have kind of done the same thing in terms of, okay, you used to do all these different freelance comic things, and now you're doing something different. You know, what do you, what do you think? I mean, because they're like 10 years older than me and stuff. And great guy. Mike Gold is a guy like that, the old DC editor and uh-huh. first comics guy and everything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's an old radio guy, too. So I kind of, you know, really sat down with him one dinner and I'm like, you know, what do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm doing this stuff. So I got some good advice from him. I also got some good advice from other radio people. And, yeah, it's just perspective. And also, um, yeah, I think cathartically, I, I bet even while you thought you were complaining, again, you kind of it's it, you obviously were listening to yourself and listening to these podcasts and saying, all right, maybe, you know, maybe it's time to turn left instead of turn right. All right, let's take a break from our conversation with Sean Crystal and tell you more about Aftershock Comics. I know you've seen the Aftershock titles on the racks of your favorite comic shops. We're talking about a whole slew of fresh, high concepts written and drawn by your favorite creators. There's the spy series Jimmy's Bastards from Russ Braun and Garth Ennis. There's Pestilence from Frank Thierry and Oleg Okunev, where the 14th century Black Plague from history actually is revealed to be the first recorded ever zombie outbreak. Or there's the early years of Vlad the Impaler in The Brothers Jack Cool from Cullen Bunn and Mirko Kolok. We'll be talking to Cullen in the, the weeks ahead. These creators came to Aftershock to tell their kind of stories with no rules, no forced continuity, just a new platform to tell great fresh concepts. You can check out more titles as well, like Beyonders by my buddy Paul Jenkins and Wesley St. Clair. We talked about him, them, in uh, one of our more recent episodes. A new series starring Leonardo da Vinci, his female apprentice Isabel, and their wooden robot, Monstro Mechanica, that's from Paul Arler and Chris Evenweiss. And there's the Midwestern Noir Hot Lunch special from Elliot Royale and Jorge Fornes. Check them out. Great books. You don't have to wait to uh, see them on your local comic shop. You can find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AfterShotComics.com. All right, let's get back to our conversation now with Sean Crystal here on Word Balloon. Did you watch the Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling? Uh yeah, the HBO thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it? Did you find? Wow, it's great to see another creative person kind of have those same kind of struggles. Of you know, I just love that one point in the first part when his goal was the Tonight Show. Yeah, and, and then he did it for you know long periods of time, and it's like, oh, I don't want that job. That's not right. who I want to be. Right. And yeah. It's like, that, well, if, you know, if I don't want to be that, then who am I? You know, that watching that, it, it was hard for me. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I mean, it, it was fascinating. And, and I watching it, I was like, oh my God, I'm learning about myself. Like it was, sure. it really was a little startling. Um, and it made me want, I want to read some, some of those auto, those biographies on him as well. But yeah, I found it fascinating. Well, and like I said, I, it, for me, it was reassuring. That, you know, because we do, we all think, God, I must be like the biggest freak in the world for having these self doubts and everything. Yeah. And then there's a guy that's so, you know, successful and God, you know, the different directions he went into. I mean, the Showtime show. I mean, that's the thing. I literally watched, you know, 90 percent of his career. I mean, once he started, you know, make me laugh back in the 80s or the 70s, even, you know, till the end, I'm like. Oh, man, I remember that Showtime show in the 80s when it was brand new. Loved yeah. Larry Sanders. Love. Oh, Larry, Larry Sanders. Sanders is great. You know, yeah, it's literally one of my all-time favorite. It's one of the best, best TV shows ever done, for sure. Yeah. I and love I, Larry Sanders. Yeah, man, there you go. And that's the thing. I So so it really, I mean, truly, like people like Bendis and some of the other creative people that I know, well, it's like, that's, that show's still haunting me. And I get it because, yeah, there is kind of an uncomfortable familiarity as well. But I truly mostly got, like, energized in terms of, okay, I'm not alone. Other people feel this way. Yeah. And step yeah. back and it's like, all right, so what do you want to do? 
as and again, it's all right. Let's start looking. Are we turning left when we should be? Are we not? You know, let's let's reassess each step right. and everything. Right. Yeah. And that's just, that's what this year's been. You know. That's great. That's great. I, I mean, through the podcast and I, from what I do, yeah, I I see that everyone's going through it. What I what was hard for the Gary Shandling documentary for me a little bit was it never went away for him. And that was a little scary. I was like, I don't want to be like successful and still feel awful. Like I, I don't, yeah. don't want to be that. Um, and that's what made kind of initiated me into th- doing different stuff. I need to change the way I think. Um, and maybe success will come through po- better being more positive and thinking more positive. Um, cause I don't, I don't want to just be miserable. <laughs> like, I hear you, man. Well, <laughs> have there, have there been, cause I know that, um, you did a great podcast with Robbie Rodriguez and it got, uh, really personal. And, uh, the and, most and, recent one you're talking about. Well, I, uh, maybe I, I just remember hearing both the one and it might've been, it might've been a while. I don't know, but I know there was one and that you, you, you even came on afterwards and you kind of did a postscript. Uh, oh, that so was, that was that the first really, one? Yeah, he, we did one this summer. Okay. Uh, apparently, he had survived a suicide attempt, and he wanted. Oh, I didn't know. Oh that. man, I'm sorry to hear that, and I'm glad he's he survived it. So that's good. God, yeah. Well, the Robbie's whole story is, yeah. is on my podcast. Um, uh, I think that episode came out in June. It wasn't that long ago. We recorded it in June. It came out in August. It was okay. really recent. Yeah. Well, tell me about yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, that's a that's a tough thing to obviously go through. I was wondering if, as you're trying to, you know, be inspired and 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 get bright things, have there been conversations you can point to and say, you know, that really changed my perspective talking to creators. Uh, I'm just starting this. It's okay. really been um, like I had banked a bunch of episodes. Um, I think there was there was definitely a shift um, around. Mm-hmm. June of last year, I felt like I was stumbling around with the podcast. Uh, subconsciously, I, I didn't want to complain anymore. I hadn't uh, acknowledged that. I hadn't seen that in myself. And I was getting kind of lost. So about a year ago, I felt more invigorated. I, I felt a new uh, a purpose in the podcast that I hadn't felt before. Um, I was just trying to get back to more being more engaged in the interviews. But and I recorded a bunch, um, and then I'd say about, uh, you know, I, you can start to hear the shift in me. I think with, with, um, I mean, I'm just, I think I'm happier in in the Mitch Garads, Dan oh, with Klaus Jansen, and in those interviews that are more recent. But then, as I've been, I've been working through self help books and trying things. So as I've been doing that, I'm like, all right, now. Um, you know, I, I want to, it was, you know, Scotty Young had reached out to me, we were just chatting and he was like, let's get back on the podcast. And I was like, yeah, let's, cause Good. he's always someone I think about when I'm like, he's just, he's so positive and, yes. and so happy. And when I look at him and, and his success, it's like, and not to take anything away from his art, uh, his art is amazing, but he just attracts people to him and his art has that in it as well. Yep. And um, so then I was like, I need to use this podcast now to, to be, to, to understand that better and think like that more so. So it's what I'm looking forward to getting into in my next series of interviews. That's excellent, man. And Scotty is a great guy. And trust me as someone that's older than Scotty, I get a lot of inspiration from Scotty because he is positive in what he does. He is he's confident. He's confident to say no to yeah. to work that he doesn't want to do, and that's something that he's always managed to do uh, correctly since his early days. Yeah, that's and, true. And, yeah, man. No, I and and again, you know, ma- manages to maximize his art and and get true joy out of it. And I, yeah, no, I I agree with you, man. And I love talking just as we are about podcast shop. Um, how he is not so you know I mean he he comes on a lot of podcasts and and he right. and, and he and Casey did a podcast for a little while and stuff right right but yeah no he's a he's a great guy to talk to and I love his perspective because he is so voracious in his uh, listening to other podcasts and stuff 
Yeah. So, yeah. no, I, I love talking to him. And, in fact, we're due because we talked right before Fairyland wrapped up. And he told uh, me what was coming up and everything, both the things he could announce and the things he couldn't announce right. publicly. And he's just like, oh, yeah, we'll talk again in the fall. I'm like, that sounds great. And, and no, I do. I love I love talking to Scotty. And also, I'm always like, yeah, Scotty, hit me. How am I doing? What do you know? What do you, right. what do you like about what I'm doing? What don't you like about what I'm doing? And he's honest. He's totally honest and stuff. No, it's been a it's been a wonderful friendship, and I I appreciate his point of view. I think he's a really smart guy. Yeah, he, he definitely is. Yeah, and um, you know, it's it's gotten into my art too, where I'm now I'm just trying to not trying to I'm getting back to enjoying it and and getting that that confidence back. Um, I, you know, I'd spent as in the podcast, I just had spent so much time doubting myself and it was somewhat recently where I stepped back. I was like, wait a minute, I know what I'm doing. I'm good at what I do. Like, why, why do I feel like this? So I'm trying to clear that out of my head too. Okay. Good to hear. Absolutely. <laughs> Seriously, man. No, that's good. You're a talented guy, dude. Right. I loved, um, I forget who wrote it, but I remember there was that daredevil, um, it was, you know, an expanded comic, and I forget what was the umbrella title for those comics, but it wasn't in the regular monthly series. I don't know what you're it, talking Daredevil about. Daredevil Black and White. That, I wasn't in that. No? No. You've never done Daredevil? I know. I would love to do Daredevil. All right, I'm in fact, I then. emailed Marvel asking for Daredevil reasons. Maybe you did a, at the same time, did you do a Deadpool Black and White? You uh, could do one of those black and white stories or books. No, I would. I mean, me. it's I'm a natural for it. You would think I've done. I'm a, a, Sean, I'm embarrassed. All right, I apologize because really, it's, it's fine. Because <laughs> I could no, I thought for sure when that stuff was coming out that you had one of those stories in one of those, you know, Aries or, or, or Daredevil. Like you know, they just had a bunch of those black and white specials. Oh, yeah. the noir ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't. I was doing Deadpool at the time. They did a Deadpool noir. Um, I did not draw that, though. Okay, and actually it was different than the noir series of books. It was a different one because they were, you know, other than I th maybe they were a little more uh, R-rated than the regular monthlies. Uh -huh. they, weren't, they weren't like retro books like the noir books. Were. Right, right. And, there was, and I love those. You know what those it is? Sean, Martinborough, Sean Martinborough did Cage Noir. I remember that. No, it's definitely not the noirs that I'm thinking of. I, oh. I'm thinking of, like I said, they were black and white specials. Yeah. And, and, and I remember I remember a Daredevil one. I remember an Aries one. I'm reasonably certain there was a Deadpool one. Yeah. Wasn't oh, no. Anyway, all right. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. I, uh, well, you know, so can you, can you tease us in terms of, or do you want to keep it quiet in terms of the guests that are coming up in this new season? Um, I, I don't – I have to record. I mean I know okay. um, I know I'm going to North Carolina Comic Con uh, in a few weeks and that's always an easy show to record at. Um, I don't know who I'll get for sure there. But I mean I know I, I'll do one with Mateo. He's coming in to stay with me before we go to the con. Great. So I know we'll do another one. Um, I know I'm going to stay with Tommy Lee. Oh, great. The, Tommy Lee Edwards. Wonderful. Yeah, his family and my family have become very close, and we my my wife's family is from Baltimore. So whenever we travel up to Baltimore, we stop at the Edwards house for a night, and then on the way up, and then we do it again on the way back, and it's a nice time. And Tommy and I go into the studio and record then. Um, so you know, I can tell you who who I'm trying. I was supposed to get in New York, but that show is so hard to record at. Totally it is Tim Sale. He's really wanting to do oh, one. Oh, great. Hey, fantastic. So I'll definitely get is he with another you. studio mate with you guys as well? He's in Essential Sequential, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um I don't have know. Done, have you done one with Dave yet, Johnson? No, Dave's one I want to get. You know, Dave is someone um I, I've always been such a big fan of his. And when I first got into the group, I was kinda like um I don't know, timid. Like I, I didn't I'm talk to him. He's Dave, you know, he, he, he's Dave Johnson. Yeah, he's Dave Johnson. <laughs> but, you know, some of the other guys like Klaus, they're like, he's Klaus Jansen. Klaus was so warm up front. Um, I just stayed back from Dave. I figured I had to earn some respect there. Okay. But that was all me. It wasn't Dave. But we went to Italy together. We had a blast. And during that time, um, we talked about him doing one. So, yeah, I'll do one with Dave for sure. That's cool. That's cool. I've only done short, like, and actually like 20 minutes or whatever with Dave. So, because... I've gotten to the point now, 
I don't like doing – certainly I don't like doing floor interviews. Yeah. Because, because yeah. that's just – as you know, and you're an in-depth guy, you want to get inside a guy's head. You know, you can't do that in five or ten minutes. And yeah. And also, it's an imposition, I think, on the creator that's when true. when they're selling stuff and also fans want to meet them. I'm always – it's it's two heads. I, on the one hand, I always say, like, going to a convention is like expensive summer camp. <laughs> because because it's hey it's all my friends and we're all together and isn't it great to see you Jesus it's been months what's going on and then you turn your head and realize oh my god I've been talking to this guy for five or ten minutes and there's three people waiting to get their book signed or get to meet him and it's like oh Jesus I'm so sorry please talk to the guy and no no we don't want to interrupt you I'm like no but you know right. you, you paid to like <laughs> meet yeah, these people yeah. and get get a sketch or get a book signed or or whatever and I'm like. No, man, I'm, 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 you know, I'm ruining your party. I'm sorry, man. So, I, so I, so I get out of the way, and that's why I would never think anymore. I mean, it was okay in 2006 and early on. Sure, yeah, cons but, are so different now. Yeah, and I mean, and also, again, no disrespect to those who do those floor interviews. There's just too many of like other podcasters and vloggers. Yeah, that, I agree. That are doing those things, and it's like. I agree. You guys go ahead. I and and truly, what I do is, and what I did with Klaus. I'm like, this is who I am. I know you never heard of me. I'm sure you don't listen to podcasts. But and again, I'm nobody. But I've managed to. Dude, talk to you'd these be people. surprised. I mean, how I got Klaus was I found out he was listening to my podcast. That's wonderful. That's excellent. And I had no idea. Well, he wasn't listening to mine, and that's okay. <laughs> I don't mind. It's okay. But that's why, luckily, I could say, I'm like, hey, man. I've had a lot of people that you've worked with before, David Mack, Bendis, uh, Sinkevich, and I go, I know, oh, oh, well, those are all good guys. I work with them all. I'm like, I know, and that's why I'd love to have you on. And yeah. And he's card. And he's like, oh, yeah. You know, and I, I'm like, and I, because he's like, well, well, I don't know if I'll have time this weekend. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, like weeks from now, when we're all relaxed and I can get you on the phone or get you on Skype. Yeah. yeah. That's why. And I guess coming from radio, because I can appreciate the intimacy that you likely want by doing it live and yes. doing it face to face. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess because of my, you know, couple decades in radio that I'm okay with a phone or, or a Skype interview and feel comfortable enough. And especially knowing that I don't have to break for traffic or a commercial spot or something like that. It's like, no man, we're all relaxed. Right. You know, we'll get, we'll right. get our initial uh, unfamiliarity out of the way in the first couple minutes and then it, you know, kind of settles into a nice conversation, and and that's why I'm I'm never, yeah. I mean, it, the barrier of it being audio only and only doing Skype and and phone, it doesn't bother me. I would love to, and it's funny, Julie Benson, you know, with all these lotteries that are, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars on the line. Like if you had that kind of money, I'm like, oh my god, I'd quit radio. I'd do word balloon full time. I'd travel a hell yeah. of a lot more. Yeah, and I would do more face to face. You know, I'm. I want to do a Portland trip. Oh my god! I was just gonna. That's so funny you say that. I'm, I'm surprised. I've been, I've been saying that for years, but I'm actually gonna do it. Good for um, you, man. Emerald City and C two E two are one week apart. They're like bookend weekends. So I'm gonna fly up to Seattle, then I'm gonna drive back to Portland with Jim Mafood, stay with him, bank a bunch of episodes while I'm there. Then go to C two E two from Portland, then come back to Atlanta. I'm not surprised, exactly. So yeah, yeah I mean that's one thing. Like I want to, if I had more finances at my disposal, I would like to take trips to areas just to record podcasts. Yep. Because honestly, conventions are just getting harder and harder to record at because everyone's got so much going on. Totally. Um, totally. So the smaller shows like North Carolina are great to record, but like Emerald City, I, I got to get episodes there and I, I, it's 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 hard, but I'm getting them in. But going to Portland after that is going to let me record them easier and I'd love to do that in L.A. I'd love to – and I yep. can't – you know, th there's areas you can hit. Like I'd like to go to Toronto and spend some yep. time with the Raid guys and I could work in the studio. I'm friends with so many of them. Um you know, like Ramon Perez is in Essential Sequential, so I could easily get to Ramon. Carrie Nord is in Essential. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that would be great and just record with raid guys. You'd get a bunch of them. So I that's something I'd yeah. like to do. It's a future goal. I mean, if if the podcast made good money, I could I could do that. I understand. Well, in my situation, I'm, you know, juggling 
uh, freelance jobs, part time part time radio jobs, and the podcast uh, just to keep going. You know, and yeah, it's, yeah, I get it. <laughs> no, I know, you, I, and I know you do. Um, I, yeah, but uh, but yeah, the same thing. I mean, believe me, and I've talked to a bunch of my Portland friends, uh, and it's like, oh, I could easily do twenty episodes if everybody were available, and that's why I kind of want to pick a non convention time to fly out and, and talk to everybody. And I was going to say, no, as you said, the smaller shows really are easier and a little yeah. more relaxed because that's when I really got to know Dave Johnson. Dave Johnson, Matt Wagner, um, I think they were the two big ones that I hadn't met at that time. But it was like 2008, 2009, and it wasn't Megacon, but it was another Orlando show. It was FXCon okay. where they had, they had comic book people. Um, but, but, you know, they – they were kind of a side thing and it was more the media people as the, a lot of current comic shows are, uh, they were the focus, but yeah, ended up, you know, me and Gene Hahn, he's like, Hey, I'm having breakfast with a bunch of the guys come with. I'm like, all right, there's Matt Wagner. There's Dave Johnson. And we all That's together. Great. we have a nice meal and it's relaxed and we're laughing and it's like, Oh man. And yeah, I mean, ever since then, no, Matt's always been a great go-to guy. Dave's been a great go-to guy. So yeah, I get it. And, and you're right. And it's those same cities, you know, I'd like to go down to Atlanta and talk to all the, the guys down there, yeah, and, and, and women, and women. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's funny, and of course, of course, we're thinking the same cities and the same circles. So yeah, man, that's that's great. Have you talked to many writers? I mean, I'm sure you've talked to artists that also write their own stuff. Um, I've you... talked to a few writers. I need to talk to more. It's not out of uh, there's no reason that I haven't spoken to more writers. I, I think just artists I knew. I guess I don't know. I, I, there are more people. I knew them. Like I, I, when I approach someone for a podcast, it's usually I'm friendly with them enough, or they've reached out to me and expressed expressed interest in being on, or they've let me know they were fans. Um, but like Donnie Cates, I had on. That's and, right. I noticed that. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. So Donnie, I, I met Donnie when he was a student at SCAD. He was in Savannah. I was in Atlanta. Okay, and I had Axel Alonzo and Jason Aaron uh, as guests on my campus, and Donnie was the only one to come up from Savannah, um, and I met him then. Um, but he also was a big fan of my podcast and had been reaching out to me, wanting to come on. So uh, I got him on in New York last year, and then that came out um, summer or sp late spring, early summer, I think. Yeah, I noticed that in your feed. Absolutely, man. I, and I intend to, uh, to listen to that. See, you and I are mere opposites because I talk to more writers. And then yeah. suddenly realize, man, it's been a while since I've talked to an artist. So I, And I keep trying – like that has been m one of my adjustments is like, oh, yeah, reach out more to artists, man. And, and don't forget how – you know, I, I always feel – because I guess I come from a writer's background – where I've written magazine articles and I've written, you know, tons of script copy for radio uh, over the years, both uh, commercial and sketch and, and other things. Right, and I just right. feel more comfortable sometimes talking to writers. Um, but then I forget that, you know, again, storytellers. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I want to have more artists on. And it's funny you mentioned John Glappy and it's like, oh, my God, I got to get John back. You yeah. know, I – I, I saw him. I didn't see him in New York, but I did see him at, uh, I want to say, C2E2. Uh -huh. and, I, and I said, yeah, man. I said, God, come back. He's like, oh, yeah, anytime. You yeah, know, and that's the thing. I Again, that. if, I had, if I had more time and I had you know more resources and stuff, oh, I'd do it every day. I mean, and that's what, like I said, that's you know certainly what I said to Julie. I'm like, oh, my God, I'd do word balloon constantly. Yeah, you know? I really <laughs> enjoy it. Like, I, I, yeah. I, had, I have no background in radio, no nothing. But I, I you know, I, I realized – I, I would have like I had a lot of friends in the industry and I had become friendly with them because at some point we had had a nice one on one discussion somewhere and it was a really good talk and we really connected. And that's when I was like, huh, I could just record that. Yep. That's what I wanted to do. That's what started it. You know, you had Brendan Fletcher on, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. I've had Brendan. Yeah. And I remember hearing before I started podcasting and I always point this out because they don't do it anymore. But he yep. was part of this podcast called hor the horror yeah, cast yeah and it's always like i was like <laughs> i was want to explain and spell it out before i say oh he's on the horror cast it's like what the hell is that i recorded with brendan the same weekend i recorded with carl 
because that was their podcast. Yes. And I think it was on my episode with Carl where we really talked about that podcast. It was fantastic. And it was yeah. the same thing I mean, like that was, describing. That could have been the first comic book podcast. I think – well, as far as – you know, I don't know what year. That's a good question because I know – there were other guys that were coming on and literally just one one man kind of, hey, this is uh, – Neil Gorman was a guy who did a, a, a podcast called Comixology well before uh, the digital store was created. <laughs> and he would – and, yeah, he was like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Uh, these are the comic books I read this week, and he'd give reviews. And that was the first one that I was aware of. And then I was aware of the horror cast. I became aware of that. Right. And this was all – you know, if not a year, uh, months before I started Word Balloon. I started Word Balloon in May of 05. And Comic Geek Speak was a group that got together, and they started in, I think, March of 05, maybe February. And certainly there was Fanboy Radio that was pre-podcasting, and they and they still exist. They're, uh, although it seems like he doesn't do as many comic book uh, interviews anymore, Scott Hines. But he was doing that out of the Texas Christian University college radio or public radio station and still does it. Um, And he started like in 2000 or 2001. And it's funny because I always, you know, we always used to tease him on when he'd show up on a podcast panel. And it's (laughs) when it's when it's convenient to be called a podcast, you refer to yourself. But you always he always liked to like put the line up and go, yeah, well, I'm a real radio show. (laughs) <laughs> of course, we all know now that yeah. doesn't mean that much in today's uh, society. No, being a real radio show, much more popular than radio shows. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, but but I did. I lo- it was exactly that thing with the Horcast. It was just this great discussion amongst creatives that you know they have the sh- their shared interests and shared language. And I'm like, oh my! I tell Brendan all the time. I haven't really talked to Carl about it, but I tell Brendan all the time. I'm like, dude, you know, you're one of the reasons why I'm doing what I do. So I love that show. Love that show. Yeah. Yeah. And I still haven't had Brendan on, unfortunately. I'm kicking myself. Shame on me. Oh, you should get him. Brendan's great. He's great. Yeah. You know, he's a great talker. And again, yeah, no, he knows what he's doing. He'd be fine. He'd he'd be, he'd be comfortable. I'm sure uh, doing word balloon and everything. But again, it's always time. Well, even you and I, Sean, I mean, that's the thing I look up and it's like, Oh yeah, last time we actually did this, this was you know three years ago or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's when I, that's when I got Brendan. It was that weekend in Ohio. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Yeah, actually. it was Brendan and Carl, and I got Cameron Stewart that same weekend yes, too. Yes, Cameron, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely. when I got them. That's right. Yep, yep. and that's why I did, I didn't want to be like, all right, you know, like. Hey, I I know Sean's talking to you. I, I don't know if you'd want to talk to me. <laughs> so I kind of did. I kind of laid back a little bit, and I knew Brendan a little bit more. So I'm like, hey, man, not to, you know, be an echo of Sean, but I hope you'll come out. Oh, yeah, we'll do it sometime. I'm like, all right, fine. And I, I don't know if I had the guts to ask Cameron or not. That's hilarious. <laughs> so That's funny. Uh, it is what it is. Exactly, man. No, it's – um well, and also it's a nice big comic book world. And, there, you know, it's so funny because some people are like – you know, you never had Claremont on. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. I haven't. And it's like, do you want to? And I'm like, no, not really. I'm like, <laughs> Just because, bo- I mean, hey, man, I respect the body of work. Right. Not, I, I've I've seen the person in, in, you know, in action. And I'm like, he, he, he doesn't need to be on my podcast. That's okay. Yeah. I'm not going to try that hard. Are there other, and I meant to ask you when you got Klaus and everything, are there other older creators that you really would love to talk to? Would you want to talk to Walter at some point? Oh my God. Yeah. I'm dying to talk to Walter. Here's a, this is, this is the craziest thing that I missed. So I had Howard on. Jacob. And Howard loves my podcast. Howard and I have become good friends. He's, he just took me right under his wing. Um, when I met him. And so I was supposed to go to San Diego one year, and he's like, look, Walter and, and Louise are coming to stay with me before the convention. Now, my brother lives in the same small town in California that Howard lives in. Wow. So, And I always go see my brother. He's like, if you come see your brother, I'll get you, me, and Walt on a podcast. Oh my God. So I was set to do it. But then my deadline shifted. I got I lost some time on the book I was on, and I had to cancel my San Diego trip. So that was one I really would have liked to got. But, yeah, I definitely want Walter. I mean, I would love to get all the – I mean, I'd love Sienkiewicz. I'd love all the artists I, sure. I grew up, you know, loving and admiring their work. Um, I mean, I would really like to get Frank Miller. 
Sure. So, I, I mean, I'd love to get Mignola, all of them, all of them. I'd love That's it. That's awesome. That's, That's great. Probably, yeah. I, uh, well, and I don't, and again, I'm, you know, a little bit older and stuff. So for me, even getting some of the Bronze Age guys has always been a delight for me. And Walter qualifies as such. Sure. And even Howard does to a degree. Yeah. Uh, you know, I love Howard. And I, and really, especially being, again, a layman, I really appreciate the fact that Howard's always willing to come back. And uh, luckily, I like so much old stuff that is of his era and even older than him. Right. You know, I mean, that's, you know, in that pre digital world, in that five television channel world. Right. We, we were exposed, <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we were exposed to so many. Uh, black and white movies and, and right. great, great books and everything because there just wasn't that proliferation that we have in today's digital world. So, I mean, you know, we had no choice but to watch the Abbott and Costello movies over and over again and <laughs> some, you know, Laurel and Hardy and the Bowery Boys and some of the other things, both right. great things and the crap because there really was no choice. It was just like, hey, I got to fill 24 hours. You're going to, you know, and it, some stations didn't even go 24 hours. That's true. So, so yeah. luckily, luckily, Howard and I have enough shared like pop culture stuff, and I I speak enough Chake and ease that I can, <laughs> you know, I, I can I can get through a conversation, and he knows I'm sincere in my in my enjoyment of the same things that he loves. Right. And every now and then I'll shock him because you know, right be, <laughs> right before funny. I right before our last talk, I was I'm a huge Turner Classic Movies guy, and you might know Bing Bing Crosby and Bob Hope made those road pictures in the in the 40s, and they were very fun fast talking comedies and actually like Bob Hope wasn't schlocky then he was actually funny and contemporary right. for his time and everything well there was an attempt to kind of do the same kind of movies with another singer and another comedian and <laughs> they had none of the charm that Hope and Crosby managed to get together <laughs> and 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 Doris Day was their femme not femme fatale but basically the girl in the movies and stuff and they're horrible and, I, and it was this Dennis Morgan and Jack Carson and Doris Day. And I told Howard, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been watching these Dennis Morgan and Jack Carson. He's like, oh, my God, they're horrible. And I'm like, yeah, man, exactly. And he goes, oh, that's great. You know, he was and I'm like, oh, there we go. We're off to the races. And plus, I love I always love Howard's comics. His comics are great. He's not afraid to be himself. Oh, I love how. Yeah. I mean, he, he was another one where, like with Klaus. I mean, Times Square, as a student yep. of comics, I learned more from Times Square in terms of how to use sound than any comic had ever taught me. I hear you. I, that's fantastic. Absolutely, man. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like, I mean, I, it would have been great to have been able to get someone like Will Eisner or Harvey Kurtzman, just my my heroes of all heroes. Certainly. Um but yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk to anyone, and I, it's not just comics. I've, I've gotten uh, some. Um, I've had a musician, an author, and I'm going to be doing more of that too. I think. Good man, absolutely. You know, don't. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you already know this, but yeah, do do the interviews that you want to do. Yeah, uh, don't yeah. let anyone tell you. Well, that's not what I came for. Because yeah, no, you know, I've never listened to that. Good. I've always been like, you know, this is for free. Uh, until I, I mean, I have a Patreon, but it's mainly for free. So if you don't like it, like I don't understand this this modern sense of entitlement. Like where people have to reach out to tell you they don't like it, and then, then don't listen. Like I don't, I don't need your opinion. Don't listen. Yep. Like no, if, I agree. If you don't well, like and, it, not for you. <laughs> well, and and by the same token, I mean, uh, as you said with Marin, yeah, it's just like eh, I'm not really interested when he talks to musicians. I would never go so far as to write him. And tell them I don't want you to do that. Right, right, right. But but yeah, no, it's and then yeah, it's fine. So I'm I feel the same way. And no, no I've, I'm, I've, I'm really happy for him because he his career is is going so well. And it, absolutely, when he started it wasn't so. And I'll tell you what, I I think his comedy is better than ever. Agreed. Agreed. So you know, I'm still a fan of his comedy, and I loved his TV show. I Me loved too. that show, Marin. I cannot believe it was canceled. It was so good, and the last season was really good. Agreed. Agreed. No, it's a it's a great show, and yeah, I mean, I like you. I have taken advantage of. Hey, do you want to talk to Phil Proctor of the Fire Sign Theater? Yeah, and it's it's like anybody under fifty that knows who the Fire Sign Theater is. I'm really impressed. <laughs> I mean, because I didn't discover them until 15 years into their career when I, when I started listening to their albums in the 80s. And they were this great subversive, if you don't know, sketch comedy group 
from yeah, from know. the West Coast. They're amazing, and there's only two left of the of the original four. The other two wow. have passed away. Wow. And Phil Phil Proctor is like one of the guys, and he's to, he just wrote his autobiography two years ago, and I just happen to get because of what I do and going to the conventions and getting on various press lists. It was like, do you want to talk to Phil Proctor? I'm like, yes, I do. Yeah. And again, I mean, you know, it's you know, I, I would say n- not the hundred percent listenership that I normally get for Word Balloon decided to download that episode. That's okay. That's fine. Right. right. You yeah. Know, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm, you know, it's it was thrilling for me. And the other I, one, the though, bottom line is, I do this for. I mean, the what sure. got me started doing this was doing this for me. Like, sure. I, I mean, and that's my art too. I, I do it for me. If people don't like it, then it's not for them. It's, I I, I'm not trying to please people. I mean, I hope they like it, but if they like it, it's because they like what I'm doing, not because I, I don't want the tail wagging the dog. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm with you, man. And also, again, I think, um, you know, the people that have done talk shows for years, um, you know, it's like Johnny Carson. Yeah. I mean, he became a familiar and, and nice, warm presence and stuff. And you did. You tuned in as much to watch him right. talk to whoever right. as as you did for the guests and everything. And it was you know, and I hope that that happens. And I think there is. There's a core audience, I'm sure that we both have, of people that are just like, no, man, I like you. I like hearing you talk to whoever you want to talk. To. Yeah, I, yeah, so, you're definitely right about that. I think. Yeah. No, it's 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 good, man. So good. Um, yeah, I, I I'm trying to think of what else is. Uh... Um. Well, I actually I gotta get going soon because okay, we can wrap it up. Waiting for me to give oh. her a watercolor lesson. But absolutely. Before yeah, let's wrap go, up. I want to talk about one more thing I have coming up. Okay. Yes, please. Trying to spread the word about. Sure. Um, a a friend of mine, uh, she's a hairdresser, uh, uh, and she had been. She's a single mom, and her daughter is very. Her dream is to be, be a marine biologist. She's now a senior in high school, and she spent every summer at marine biology camps, getting certifications in scuba diving, all, all sorts of stuff, and. My friend, with every dime she makes, she pumps it into her daughter's dream. And she had saved about 10 years' worth of tips. Well, maybe not 10 years' worth, but a lot a lot of tips uh, in cash, in home, in her house, in her safe. And it was about eight grand worth. And someone broke into her house, knew exactly where to go, uh, used a – it was it was a good safe. I guess there, there are ways to crack them with magnets these days. Wow. And cracked the safe and got took all the cash, took nothing else from the house and left. Jeez. So it was someone she knew and I, I just – I don't know. It just hit me. And I would spent a lot of time um, more recently trying to figure out what I can do to, to better this world, to use what I do and use what I have to help in some way. I mean one of the things I, I wrestle with in our current culture is the fact that community is just eroding and everyone's all about themselves. Yeah. And so uh, this one kind of hit me hard. She's a friend of my wife's too. And I was just like, wait a minute, I can do something about this. Um, and she, she actually trims my beard and her friend does my hair and it's her friends. The the woman who does my hair, it's her salon. So I kind of pulled her inside. I said, look, I have this idea. I could ask a bunch of artists I know who I'm friends with, if they'd be willing to do a sketch and we can have an auction and give all the money to her and try to get back what she lost at least, maybe more. I, I don't know. Um, and she was like, that's great. And she was all completely behind it. But we both agreed we couldn't tell uh, Jamie, who, who was the one that was robbed, because she would never – she's too proud. She would never hear like hearing this. But after the fact, she would have no choice. So um, I did. I, I have about half of the pieces in my hand now. And on November 1st, we're going to start eBay auctions. Every week we're going to release four to five pieces uh, for auction that week, and they'll be auctioned off. So every week in November. So by the end of November, it'll be wrapped. Um, and we're also going to have a GoFundMe. And the, every sketch is of Batman. Because everyone likes to see artists do Batman. Absolutely. I think we're going to call it – and we're working it out now, but Blessings from Batman I think is what it will be called. We'll have an eBay page that they're putting together. Today we talked about that too. Um, but I've got Klaus Jansen original, Eric Canetti. I mean 
Tim Sale. I mean, I've got I've got some incredible pieces of art with more coming in. Um, so I just want to start spreading the word. Uh, if you follow me on social media, you'll see when I put it out. Um, uh, getting the word out through your podcast is very helpful. And I'm My just try, trying to use every avenue I can to spread the word. I told some of the um, – there's a community of, of higher-end art collectors that we know because they come to Essential Sequential and buy a lot from us. So I told some of those guys, hey, we're going to be doing this. So they're waiting for the final word on on um, what it's going to be called and everything. But just through my social media and through every artist we have, we'll be getting the word out. But on November 1st, it's going to start. And, that sounds excellent. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's, a again, a beautiful cause for a local uh, cause and everything. I think that's wonderful. Uh, so remind people. Um, you know, Ink Pulp Audio, but like give give all your uh, places where okay, people can find yeah, so all the info. On, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, I am at Ink Pulp, I-N-K-P-U-L-P, one word. And that's all, that's all my social media. So I'll be, I'll be announcing, you know, the day of the release and I'll be putting links up and all that stuff. But uh, be on the lookout if you're interested in that. We're also going to have a GoFundMe. So if you don't want to buy a piece of artwork, but you want to give a buck, we'll have a GoFundMe for the people that want to do that too. Sounds great, man. Excellent. Well done, Sean. Thank Keep you. Up the great work, and, and it sounds again. If it's any encouragement from a layman, I think you're on the right direction, and I and I'm thrilled that you are part of the podcast, brethren. And uh, absolutely, man. No, it's a pleasure talking to you, and continued success. And uh, yeah, sounds like like I said, you're going in the right direction, man. Keep it up. Thank you. I appreciate it, John. Thanks for having me on. There you go. Nice conversation with Sean Crystal. Check out Ink Pulp Audio. It's coming back. And in fact, this conversation will be one of his first episodes back uh, here in November. So uh, be looking for that on uh, Sean's platform and, of course, here at WordBalloon.com. But you just heard it. There are two other episodes that are coming out today on Word Balloon. We've got a great conversation with Sanford Green. We're talking about his new image book with David Walker. It's called Bitter Root, and it's a terrific Monster Hunter book that uh, takes place in the backdrop of the Harlem Renaissance. It's a great story, and I think uh, David and Sanford and Chuck Brown, uh, the other co-writer, are uh, doing a great job on the series. It's a pleasure to have Sanford back. We also talk about his webtoon series, The 1000, and uh, it's a great conversation. I'm happy to welcome Sanford back to Word Balloon. Also, Eric Esquivel. Now, you might remember Eric and Dave Baker years ago were on Word Balloon talking about their mini-comic, well, now Eric is a Vertigo writer and is part of the incredible book, Border Town. Huge hit, been selling out each issue, and it's a big, broad step uh, in a very cool direction for Vertigo. Happy to have Eric on to talk about that. Another great episode you'll find on the Word Balloon feed today, so check it out. Thanks again for listening today. It was brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. If you want to subscribe to Word Balloon, do you think Word Balloon's worth a dollar a month? Do you think it's worth $3 a month? You can help the cause out by going to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or click on the Patreon ad on the front page of wordballoon.com. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. You'll find great hit series for them that are on the racks right now. Things like A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Goran Suzuka. Hot Lunch Special from Elliot Rayal and Jorge Fornes. Beyonders by Paul Jenkins and Wesley St. Clair. And Lollipop Kids from Adam and Aiden Glass and Diego Yapur. Check it out. You can go to their uh, website and get full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes to order these books through your local comic shop at AfterShotComics.com. Thanks again for listening. More great episodes still to come uh, to uh, start November off. These are the last batch of the October shows. But again, check out my conversation with Sanford Green. Check out my conversation with Eric Esquivel. Uh, it's great to uh, talk to them about their very interesting books from Image and Vertigo, respectively. And uh, just more great conversation here at WordBalloon.com. More surprises to come in November. I hope you'll stay with us. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2018.